COPPA is one of those few privacy rules that we enforce that has civil penalties. In my judgment, this is an eye-popping civil penalty. Maybe you've heard, as of January 1st, 2020, content creators could be liable for a fine of $42,530 per video. I am here with my unkempt hair to tell you that children's advocacy groups have lobbied the FTC for years to update laws surrounding YouTube specifically. Somewhat unsurprisingly, YouTube was collecting data from children for years, which violated a law called COPPA, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. Turns out you're not supposed to collect data on children under the age of 13. However, you have to be 13 years old to have an account on this site. So YouTube was always making the argument to the FTC that they were within the bounds of the law. But then uh, it turns out that over 70% of children under the age of 13 in America are on this website regularly. And um, well, YouTube was still collecting their data via browser cookies. If you don't know, cookies are like those things that save your password so you don't have to type it in every time. They, they collect data on you. Usually they're useful, but this time it was just giving YouTube information that, um, well, they could use secretly. And they did. I'm sorry, YouTube. I'm not trying to throw you under the bus. I'm just reporting what happened here. Thank you, manual review person. You might be wondering why YouTube would do this. The obvious answer is money, but it goes a lot deeper than that. Behind this whole COPPA controversy is the story of a company called YouTube just doing what they had to do. I'm not saying they did nothing wrong. All I'm saying is YouTube has secretly been in a bit of a tight spot lately, and uh, they thought that their way out of that tight spot was to exploit the eyeballs and impressionable minds of uh, kids with small fingers that have access to their mommy's credit card. <laughs> That's one way to get out of a tight spot. This is the story of how things got to the point where an emotionally repressed man working for the FTC gets pleasure in saying he can find creators up to his azzle. The analogy that I think of, the expression about shooting fish in a barrel. YouTube is the barrel and the content creators are the fish. This is the story of a once beautiful company that's need to maximize profits now threatens the stability of everyone who relies on it. This is the story of YouTube and COPPA. The story... You never knew. Whoa, come on! The YouTube community has been freaking out over these laws enacted by the FTC. However, a lot of the fear-mongering is either misinformation or it's just, well, fear-mongering. I also want to use this opportunity to paint a big picture view of YouTube and talk about how everything got to this point. But before we begin, I just want to say that I love YouTube. This platform is a place where anybody can post virtually anything for free and it has a chance to be seen by anyone anywhere. That is a powerful idea. See, YouTube is my daddy and like all adults who call their father daddy, our relationship has some issues. Many creators feel the same way. However, I will not be using this video as a springboard to say mean things about the play button with masculine chest hair. Rather, I will be talking about the truth, which may or may not sometimes involve some less than flattering facts about YouTube. Why was YouTube so quick to gather data on children? Didn't daddy care about the children? We already talked about money, so let's get deep. In 2006, Google bought YouTube for $1.6 billion. You might know Google as that company that changes their doodles every so often and used to have in their mission statements, don't be evil, but they don't have it in there anymore. They are also one of the largest, most powerful corporations in the world. And it kind of makes sense that a company with that kind of resources would buy something as large scale and complicated as a website getting billions of views a day. Here's a problem you may not have known about though. YouTube YouTube isn't that profitable. It's not losing money or anything, but in 2015, they were just barely breaking even, and even today, they don't disclose their advertising revenue unless it's necessary. In April of 2019, they came in $1 billion below Wall Street's expected value. Turns out, making YouTube possible is 
expensive. Do you know how many servers and employees you need to maintain a website where 300 hours of video are uploaded every minute? It's more than Olive Garden, Wimbledon, and probably Pornhub. Then, 2017 happened. 2017 was an unfortunate year. See, daddy's handsome son PewDiePie liked funny Hitler jokes and the Wall Street Journal wrote an article about it and then they wrote an article about ads running on videos where the N-word was said and basically Hitler and the N-word are so powerful that they caused the adpocalypse. All of a sudden, Coca-Cola, Johnson & Johnson, Toyota, all the big corporations with deep pockets did the thing your dad never did to your mom they pulled out. And they told Google that Google needed to get it together and have more control over where their ads are shown. That's when YouTube deployed their AI, which demonetized videos strictly and slowly learned over time which videos had the N-word and which ones simply had the word vinegar. Also, it learned to catch violence and sex and stuff that a lot of advertisers don't like. And over time, it, it actually kind of works. But point is, Daddy has had a, uh, a bit of a history of some uh, less than stellar financial finances. But Daddy wanted to keep putting food on the table for all of his sugar babies uh, slash rich investors. He was handing out all the ad revenue he could to creators, but deep down, he really couldn't afford all those times out at Sizzler for all you can eat ribs. Then, things got better. PewDiePie only said the N-word one time after corporate advertisers began coming back, but nobody seemed to mind too much. Things were going back to the way they used to be. Sort of. There were plenty of controversies after 2017. There were weird pedo rings slyly operating through YouTube comments and Elsagate was a thing. And Viners started running their fingers through daddy's chest hair. All in all, YouTube has struggled to make money over the years and that's probably why they tried to do the FTC dirty for so long. Obviously, I don't know this for sure. I don't know what's going on in the boards of YouTube. I'm just saying, it, it makes sense. That's why since 2013, YouTube has been so quick to tell the FTC that they are COPPA compliant simply by not allowing anyone under the age of 13 to have an account on the site. The FTC simply didn't know enough about new media to call them out on it. Until April of 2018. When 20 child advocacy groups filed a complaint to the FTC about how YouTube was violating COPPA. Turns out, for the first time in history, the people yelling, Won't someone please think of the children? That, that person was actually right. They said daddy was lying about his platform being for people over the age of 13. And, uh, well, it, it shouldn't really be surprising that that wasn't true. Ask any elementary or middle schooler what they want to be when they grow up, and they'll probably say YouTuber. Not to mention the amount of kids' content on this platform is mind-boggling. You think you can trust someone? Anyway, the child advocacy groups who squealed on my functioning alcoholic father argued that because YouTube had violated COPPA for so long, it should be banned from hosting any kids' content at all. It should be extremely restricted how kids' content is dealt with on the platform. So on top of paying a $170 million fine, the once former alpha male presented its belly to the FTC in an act of shameless submission in hopes of pleasing them. This guy was definitely into it. Suddenly, us YouTubers got emails saying that we had to mark our channels or videos as for kids or not for kids. Apparently, there's no such thing as a gray area, which is surprising because if you look at this guy's haircut, it's definitely in a gray area. It's like half Trump comb over, half shitty Justin Timberlake. <laughs> not that I could talk. This is... This is a disaster. Now, you might be wondering what exactly the difference is between videos marked for kids and videos marked not for kids. Videos marked for kids will not collect data from viewers. They will not contain personalized ads. They will not have comment sections, info cards, or end screens. They will also not be searchable or savable to watch later. And on the channel level, for kids channels won't have notifications or a community tab. It's full on castration, Game of Thrones style. This of course means a swift death for any channel that is making its living off of kids content. This change also gave 
gave the FTC the green light to sweep through the platform and sue whoever they deem as marketing to kids while not marking their video as such. YouTube is rather vague about what it even means to have a video that's for kids. If a video has certain characters or games or actors or toys or songs that might appeal to kids, then that could be a problem. For instance, we have videos on Sonic and Mario. Those franchises usually are rated E for everyone. Kids do play them, but so do a lot of adults. Hence the word everyone. Could the FTC deem these videos as for children simply for having Sonic slapped onto them? As it stands now, they totally could, and that's a problem. We don't make kids content. We're, we're a little too edgy for that. In fact, the Dolphin Tribe doesn't accept anyone under the galactic age of 42. I personally am 5,000 years old. Yet despite all of this, some douche nozzle up in the government might see characters that some kids like and just be like, oh, you know, I think, I think Tree School makes kid videos. Uh, $42,530 fine for you! I don't have $42,000, like at all. And the FTC says they plan to make these decisions on a surface level analysis. So if all of our videos got hit as child appealing, we would owe the federal government somewhere in the ballpark of $21 million. $21 million. Uh, I said I didn't have $42,000. I don't know, 21 million. Wish I did though. Wouldn't give it to the FTC, I'm telling you that. You might say that uh, all of this wasn't very well thought out and it all could have been avoided if YouTube was more honest and upfront in the first place. Which brings me back to my first question. Why was YouTube so reckless with targeting children in the first place? Now, we know that Daddy hasn't exactly been a profiteering powerhouse. So by squeezing those high energy creatures that love Spider-Man and Elsa videos, YouTube was able to keep the lights on and convince investors that they at least weren't losing money. But now that kids content is on the verge of death, what's a struggling father to do? Sitting a lazy boy with a fifth of Tennessee honey and thinking about what could have been? I'm legitimately worried about the future of this platform. And again, I want to make it totally clear that I really do love YouTube. I love it so much. It's beautiful. I feel so lucky that I can make videos for a living and not have to pitch my ideas to a council of old white guys in business suits that are too big on them. This is a miracle. This is a miracle of the modern age. And I wanted to win and succeed and be successful. But where are those dollars gonna come from? Obviously, YouTube has that Google money, which is a lot of money, but business is business. And if YouTube is not pulling in enough revenue, then eventually Google might be like, hey, YouTube, this isn't working out. Boop. That was the sound of YouTube no longer existing. How long would it take? Five years, 10 years of uh, less than stellar profits? I don't know. I don't know. Regardless of what exactly the future holds, all of this is a scary thought. Creators are vulnerable to the FTC, which may or may not understand what they're even looking at. YouTube just lost a big chunk of its revenue stream, and this guy who spoke on behalf of the FTC definitely doesn't get laid enough. Life on YouTube may get weirder from here. As that happens, creators will need to rely more on their audience to make ends meet. It'll be more important than ever to support your favorite creators flaunt their merch and support their Patreons. Whatever you can afford and are willing to give. So here we are. As of January 1st of 2020, you may not recognize YouTube, but there is still time to change this unfair and draconian law. Down below is a link to a petition that you can sign and tell the FTC that you will not stand for totalitarian crackdowns of expression, of videos, the videos you love to watch, of the people you love to watch. This petition will help tell the FTC that this is important to you. And not only can you sign this petition, but please, please leave a comment. Tell them why exactly you are against the new law and what exactly YouTube means to you. For those that aren't quite sure what to say, we have a template down below in the description. It'll help you a lot, it'll make it super easy, and you can do it because you are beautiful and you've got the drive. But seriously, tell them what you think of the new rules and tell them why this is going to hurt the ecosystem. Do it now! I'm Grant, and I sincerely hope that you join me in the fights to keep YouTube from imploding. 
That's the story of YouTube and Kaba. The story you never knew. Shooting fish in a barrel. YouTube is the barrel, and the content creators are the fish. Shooting fish in a barrel. YouTube is the barrel, and the content creators are the fish. Shooting fish in a barrel. YouTube is the barrel, and the content creators are the fish. Shooting fish in a barrel. YouTube is the barrel, and the content creators are the fish. Shooting fish in a barrel. YouTube is the barrel, and the content creators are the fish.